Good morning. How you doing this morning? Four people are doing good. Glad to hear it. You already know when I come up here, I need like, I need the return. How are you doing this morning? That's all right. That was pretty good. My name is Dylan Hadley. I'm the Connections Director here at the church. A lot of what I do here is, uh, as newer people come into our midst, my heart and my goal is to uh, put them in our community so that they are known and loved and they can walk hand in hand, heart in heart with people, all pursuing Jesus together. We're not meant to do this on our own, are we? No, this is all about community and being a family of God who pursues him with one another. Faults and brokenness and all bring it all to the table because he's worth it. That's like, that's one of my favorite things about communion is like, like the body and the blood and what he did and what he does for us still and for people. And then also this constant reminder that God wants to be at the table with us, that he wants to feast with us. And it's not this come and go, this participate in a sacrament and then leave and walk independently away from God. Rather, he wants us to walk hand in hand, heart in heart with him and journey through life with him. He desires to be with you, to be in communion with you throughout your entire life. That like that's communion for us is that he's inviting us to his table and to never leave, to always be in an abiding, abiding relationship with him. So that's like kind of my heart this morning is that we would enter, uh, this wouldn't be like just another message or like a TED talk and just listen to this guy for 40 minutes so we can get out of here, but like 30 minutes maybe if I'm lucky. But like that we would enter or continue communion with him. This wouldn't be about really you or me at all. It would just be about us as a family of God being in communion with the Father. So let's pray. God, we're so thankful to have you. We're so thankful that you call us to your table to be in constant, lifelong communion with you. As we abide in you, you abide with us. God, we ask for more of your Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out God, that we would be found faithful and obedient and worthy of the calling that you have for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We're in the middle of a message series right now. What's it called? Revel the Revival. And this is week three out of six. So we're kind of at this turning point. We're at the, uh, the pinnacle moment, kind of, uh, headed our way onto the trail end of this series, uh, specifically looking at the books out of the Bible of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so Ezra and Nehemiah give us this great picture of what it looks like to follow God's purposes rather than your own. So we've been talking about then our God calling on our life, God's assignments. And uh, before, before we get too far, I, I do want to say when we talk about calling or when I say that word, you are, you are forgiven if like when I say calling, you kind of like roll your eyes a little bit because like I understand it's like a lofty word and there's probably a little bit of baggage. Like when you're, when you're younger, call, calling is just like, you know, you have the whole world at your fingertips and everybody starts asking you, you know, what's your calling? And so like our culture uses calling in so many different contexts and ways and it starts to muddy the waters and it's like, what even actually is your calling in life? It's so popular. You ever, okay, here's a good example. You ever as a kid start to say a word so many times, like on a really long road trip in the car, you have nothing to do. You start to say the same word over and over and over again and it starts to not even sound like a real word anymore. Yeah, like you're like green, 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 green. It's like, I don't even think that's a real word anymore. Anybody? Just me, okay. Maybe I should get myself checked out because I did that all the time. <laughs> like, okay, this guy's got to, yeah. I, 
I think it's similar for calling is it's just like, I, it's used in so many contexts that it's like it kind of loses its, its oomph, its value, its power. And like when you are in your younger years, 20s, 30s, or we're about to have graduation Sunday. And so, you know, you graduate high school or you graduate college. And what does everybody ask you at your grad party? You're just trying to eat some good food. And everybody's asking you like, oh, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And you're like, I'm 18 years old. The chill. Or it's like, oh, what career are you going into? And, or, or you'll hear that language. Like, what do, you, what do you feel like you're called to in life? And it's like, I literally have no idea. Right? It's like, if you were like me, I was like, I like soccer. And my soccer coach told me I should do something with that. So I went into physical therapy and like, that didn't work out very well. You know, like, look where I'm at now. You know, but it's like, you just, it's hard to know, even with college, it's like, what's your true calling in life? It's like, I, I don't even know. And I'm so tired of hearing that, that I don't even think I have a calling on my life anymore. Or on the other side of the spectrum, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you start getting older and that word calling starts to just get a little lofty. Like, it's like, calling on your life what's your true one purpose in life like find your true self and it's just it's like I don't even know what that means because it's like you talk about calling I'm just trying to like figure out how to pay my bills right is that my calling I don't think that's my calling but I gotta do it find your one true calling for a lot of people often myself included it seems outside of the realm of our everyday life and I get it it's like, <laughs> this happened to me this week. It's like, you're trying to find your calling. It's like, I'm doing good to find my keys in the morning, right? Like, okay, last Thursday, quick story. I got up at like five in the morning, is inspired by Caleb. He's like, I get up at two o'clock in the morning and pursue the Lord. No. <laughs> I get up early occasionally. I'm trying to work my way out. So I get up at, I got up at five on Thursday. I was like, I'm gonna pursue the Lord. I'm gonna go on a walk. And I lock my keys in the car. I get out there, and you're like, well, simple solution, Dylan. Go inside, get the spare key. Yep, don't have one of those for that car. Just got one key. Okay, I have a solution, though, because I've done this so many times. I'm not kidding you. I got on Amazon, like, last year, bought one of those, like, door jam kits that, like, the police use to, like, help you, like, you know, squeeze the little ball and, it, like, it separates your door so that you can get in there with a coat hanger. I bought one of those because I've literally done this so many times. And I know what you're thinking. You could just literally go buy a spare key. And to that, I say, you're right. I could do that. But that would be too easy. I get it. <laughs> I get when we say calling, it's a lot, especially when you're just trying to find your keys in the morning, trying to remember to pick up your kids from practice so you're not that parent that leaves them at the field until eight o'clock at night. I, like I, whatever it is. And as much as I do understand that, I don't, under, I don't know everything that you have on your plate. You don't know everything that I have on my plate necessarily. Um, I like I get it but as much as I do understand try to understand I I know that and Caleb can attest to this is most most more than half of the questions that a pastor is asked deals with questions surrounding your identity and your calling and it's like why is that still if it's just this lofty word and it's because I think in all of us there's this desire to really still kind of want to figure out what we're made for, like our purpose, and find your identity and the, and the call of God on your life. And so it's like, who am I really? It's in all of us, whether it's buried layer between layer, like layer of busyness and then hurry, and then the world's just really loud, and I've been distracted, and I've been disappointed. And so you're calling, and the idea of calling gets buried, but still deep within you, it's still there. Because, like, we try to find satisfaction in other things, but we end up being unsatisfied still yet again doesn't matter how many friends you have or followers you have, how much money you make, how big the house is, where you've been on vacation last year. It's a well that we're trying to dig on our own and we just find out as soon as we start digging to find satisfaction, it just is a shallow well. It leaves us craving more over and over and over again. And it is because part of like, 
God's calling on your life, if it's truly from him, it also has an effect on who you become and your identity. And so we go into these things like expecting an increased level of comfort or security and we find unsatisfaction left with the question, what is my purpose in life? <laughs> okay, so in the last couple weeks, Caleb talked about both this very broad and this very specific elements of, of calling. We're trying to use language here that helps us understand what the, word actual, what the word calling actually means. So there's this macro and this micro perspective. In the macro sense, first and foremost, we are called to Jesus. We are called to lay down our life for him. And then also in the macro sense, there's often, for every single person in the room, there's a more focused purpose on your life that God has actually given and spoken over your life. But that's also still in the macro sense. And that gives us, both of those two things help us form our identity of who we are in Christ. Paul is a really good example of this. Paul's calling was to Jesus first and foremost. I claim to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then there was, an, uh, there was also a call on his life from God to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so I read that and I'm like, an apostle to the Gentiles, good for you, man. What does that mean for Monday? Like what? There's a lot of Gentiles. There's a lot of places to go, Paul. So what are you gonna, what are you gonna do with that call on your life? And so I read that, and that's where we get into the micro, the assignment. This is not now the broad calling on your life, but it's what you are assigned to in this season. And that's why it gets confusing because I'm not kidding, we just like use calling for all of these things, assignments and, and purposes, and then God's call to just come to him as like a, a follower and an apprentice to him. We just say, oh, it's just our calling. And it just gets so muddied up. But you are given a calling, first and foremost, to the person of Jesus. You are called to Christ. Beyond that, God will speak things over your life, giving you a renewed and a greater sense of identity found in him. And then with that calling comes assignments. The assignments are the practical, okay, what am I going to do now? Another thing that makes callings and assignments difficult beyond just the word being used over and over and misused, is I think, and this is something we see a lot, is we, we struggle when things get hard. Is, you know, like I, I was trying to f f pursue God's calling on my life. I, was, I thought this was the assignment for my season, but I'm, I'm experiencing some resistance now. Things are not looking the way that I thought they would go. I'm seeing more resistance and pushback in every direction than I'm seeing any breakthrough. You're up here talking about rubble the revival. I got piles of rubble all around me and I don't see any revival in sight. And so then we start to doubt our calling, doubt God, like is this really what the Lord had for me. This can't be because I'm going through so much resistance. I, like, I can't make this work. So we start to doubt that we even have a call at all. A good example of this, like, so just say you're, you're, you feel called to bring light to the darkness. And so that's like your purpose. You know, you're called to Christ and you want to bring light to the darkness. And so you, okay, what's my assignment? I'm going to start with the poor and the needy, the less fortunate. Jesus calls us to those people. And so, you know, I'm going to use my resources to go help the less fortunate. And then you lose your job. And you're like, oh, that must have not been my calling. Like, what am I supposed to, I don't have resources to give anymore. Or, or like, you, you know, you're like, ah, like I really wanna pour into the next generation. I'm called to disciple the next generation because we need that. We need students who are zealous and on fire for the Lord. And so I, I like, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna be called to disciple like teenagers and all this stuff. And then you step in Vineyard Student Ministry on a Wednesday night and they look at you and you're like, they start talking about you like, dude, that, look, that guy looks like he's like 80 years old. And you step in there thinking like, you're gonna be the cool guy in town. Like, I'm gonna disciple you. And they're like, dude, you are old. <laughs> you are just old. You know, and they start and you're like, man, this like, it sounded good in my head. And then I actually started to try to do it, you know? Or like, you're in your 20s and you're like, oh, I'm on fire for the Lord. And everybody's asking me my calling in the world. I could go, I could go anywhere, do anything, be anybody. And then like, life happens and it gets busy and you get distracted. And then you're 40 
and you have no idea what the call of God is on your life. <laughs> There's three guys, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel. These are the three main guys that we see in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah. It's originally one book in our Bible. Now today it's split in two. We've already gone through their uh, backstory just a little bit, but I wanna take a look at each each of these guys' callings uh, and their assignments because they experienced resistance too, let me tell you. <laughs> but it was something was different for them despite the resistance. Can we pull up that graphic, that first graphic that I have? Cool, I know it's wordy, but I hope this helps you. I wanna give honor to the word of God and study it well. So our first call is to Jesus. The same thing was for them, is to love and to be faithful to the Father. First and foremost, their macro calling was that, their big life calling. But like for Zerubbabel, he was also called, or his purpose was to be a leader and a builder. For Ezra, he was called to be a reconciler, reconcile people back to God. And for Nehemiah, he had the calling on his life to see Jerusalem restored. That was his purpose. These weren't callings that they just came up with, put some Christianese terms on it to make it sound cute. This was something that the Lord gave them. He stirred up their hearts. We talked about this the last two weeks. If you haven't watched those, go back on YouTube and watch them. But God stirred up their hearts and their whole family lineage. He stirred them up for these things. It was something he spoke over their life. And then with these God callings came assignments. For Zerubbabel, he was to rebuild the temple and restore worship. Ezra, he was to teach the law and reconcile the people back to the heart of God. Nehemiah, he was to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And this is important. This is, it's important to remember, like those were not just the only, like, the only assignments that they had. Like it wasn't just, you know, Nehemiah is supposed to rebuild the wall. Once you're done with that, you're good to go. Retire, like ride it, ride it smooth. That's your only assignment. Like there's multiple assignments in our life. Sometimes there's several assignments at the same time. So if you're a husband or a wife in the room, you are called to be a lover of your spouse and a servant to your spouse. But also that doesn't mean that that's your only job because you got to go to work, right? <laughs> if you're a parent in the room, your call, one of your calls or your purposes is to be a parent. You are, forever an, you are forever a parent, but your assignment with those children change. You're not going to be wiping butts for the rest of your life. I hope not. You're 18 years old, still doing that. Like, we got to talk. But, like, the assignment changes. The purposes maybe are the same, but we have multiple assignments, multiple purposes at the same time. It's not a one and done situation. So let's, let's talk Zerub, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, by the way. Okay, <laughs> I know, I know y'all like to name your kids after like people in the Bible, right? Everybody likes to do that. Zerubbabel. Find me a little Zerubbabel in this church, like run around like, oh, come here Zerubbabel, you know what I mean? Okay, Caleb last week, he was, he was, what? He was reading out of Ezra, I think it was. And he get, he's like reading through all these names and he gets through and it's like Aaron and all this stuff. And he gets to Uzi and Buki. And I'm like, <laughs> somebody needs to have twins right now and name their kids Uzi and Buki. Be like, oh, hey, I got Uzi, I got Buki. It's like, we see a lot of Hannahs running around, but like we need Uzi and Buki right now. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be mad. We're gonna have a problem if we don't get an Uzi and a Buki up in the house. But anyway. Side note, that's how my brain works. Zerubbabel, <laughs> little Zerubbabel, I just can't. No. Zerubbabel was a leader. He led, the, he led the Jews who returned to Jerusalem after the exile, they got sent, Babylonian exile, they come back to Jerusalem. Zerubbabel is one of the leaders of those people. They come back and they see Jerusalem is completely in shambles, complete pile of rubble. So they wanted to reestablish the temple. So he starts to rebuild the temple, follow God's assignment on, on his life. But then Ezra chapter four, we see the first time that he faces, faces any resistance. It talks about this group of enemies that come to Zerubbabel as he starts to rebuild and they attempted to stop him. It says by putting, the, putting fear in all of the people. And it doesn't clarify what that actually means at all. It's just like fear, fear, fear. I don't know, I don't know, like, but by putting fear in the people. And then it says they bribed the officials to work against them and make it hard to keep rebuilding the temple. 
So furthermore, then they wrote a letter to the king and they're like, hey, this is a Rebbebel guy and his crew are rebuilding the temple. And they said this, this like city that they're trying to rebuild, it's, it's a wicked city. And also like if they get the walls up, then the taxes from that city, they're not gonna go to the royal revenue anymore. So king, you're gonna lose money. And so the king was like, you're probably right. So I'm gonna issue a statement or a decree that tells them to stop rebuilding the temple. And so at this point in the story, if we were Zerubbabel, we'd probably say, we'd probably look like, I got a letter from the president to tell me to stop my calling. I'm gonna probably just stop. Like I'm facing resistance, I'm out. This probably isn't the call of God on my life, but just wait. You ever, ha- you ever have a, that one of those moments like where you're like, I, like there's no way in sight, but then like God does a big thing in your life and you're like, whoa, he made a way. We call that like a but God thing. Look at your neighbor and say, but God. Look at your neighbor and say, but God. Okay, thank you. We call that a but God moment. The building of the temple had stopped. The, the king had stopped. The orders worked and Zerubbabel was done rebuilding. The resistance had worked, what it seemed, but God would see to it that the assignment carried on. Because in chapter five, it says, God sent two prophets to prophesy over the project. Chapter five, verse one, it says, now Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the prophet, a descendant of Ido. That, I think it's Ido. It looks like Ido, which, talking about kids' names, Ido the kiddo, I just. (laughs) I'm still with Uzi and Buki, though. Those are my favorite. So he sends Haggai, the prophet, Zechariah, the prophet, a descendant of Ido, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of, Israel, of the God of Israel who was over them. So God sends them prophets to, to prophesy over the assignment and to encourage them. And so there's this but God moment because he literally sends them reinforcements. It says, after the prophets came, Zerubbabel and the people set to go back to work to rebuild the temple this time with the prophets with them supporting them. Then it says the governor of the land and his associates then came back and talked to Zerubbabel and questioned him as he started to get back to work. They said, who even authorized you to rebuild this temple and what are your names? And Zerubbabel said, my name is Uzi and Buki. No, it's kidding. I'm done with it, I'm done with it. He didn't say anything. Zerubbabel didn't answer. This is what it says. They came and questioned, why are you doing this again? We told you not to. And it says, but the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews and they were not stopped until a report could go to Darius, who was then the king at the time, and his written reply could be received. So they kept building, they kept building. But the governor and the enemies came back, sent another letter to the king, don't you hate when that happens, telling him to stop once again. But this time the king got a little bit smarter. This is a new king, King Darius. And so before he decided to tell them to stop again, he's like, maybe I should double check. This isn't actually supposed to happen. So the king goes back to all the old records and he finds a scroll from a king back, way back, King Cyrus, who issued the first decree that the rebuilding of the temple would happen and there would be revival in Jerusalem. And so it came to pass. We see in Ezra chapter six, verse 16, it says, then the people of Israel... The priests and the Levites and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. So the foundations of the temple were finally laid. They were finally able to do it and they celebrated the rebuilding of the temple. Oh, but over and over and over and over again, we see the only way that they were able to do this was these like God moments where he, in the face of resistance, he provides provision for the call that he has given them. And he wasn't the only one, Ezra. Ezra's assignment, remember, was to reconcile Israel back to God. He was trying to teach them the law and bring them back to the very heart of of God and who God is. While he was trying to teach them, he found out that some of the priests and the Levites had taken up pagan wives from outside nations, which directly went against God's commands and law. So it says, it says, he, in the face of the sin and the resistance, Ezra tore his clothes, pulled out his hair because he was so frustrated. But then God used Ezra. There's this, there's this turning point in the book where 
Ezra, through the Lord's power, brings the whole people back through this beautiful moment of repentance. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 6 says, Ezra then praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen and Amen. Then they bowed, the, they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy f choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So for Nehemiah, let's look at him. He was called to restore Jerusalem, and his assignment was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And I love how confident he is in this calling because he knew what the Lord had on his life. J Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18 says, I told them about the gracious hand of God that was on me and what the king had said to me. He's talking about King Cyrus. They replied, let us start rebuilding. Then they began this good work. And then Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, oh my gosh, heard about it. They mocked and they ridiculed us. And this, this sounds like Zerubbabel's case. What is this you're doing, they asked. Have you rebelled against the king? He says, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. So he begins to rebuild the walls, but shortly after, again and again and again, they mock and ridicule him. This time their mocking and ridicule doesn't work. So they increased the resistance and they plotted to attack the people rebuilding the wall. But he got smart. Nehemiah got smart. And so he started, he found out about the, the attack ahead of time. So he started placing people, uh, the wall wasn't finished yet. So he started placing people alongside the wall where it was in the weaker sp spots of the wall so that they couldn't actually get through when they came to attack. And this is what he says. He tells the people that are standing there ready to fend off an attack. He said, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Fight for your families, fight for your wives and your homes, and always remember our God will fight for us. I love that. There's like, there's this confidence in his calling because he knew that God had a plan and a call for his life and for the future of Jerusalem. I, remind that, I hope that reminds you Jeremiah 29. For I know I have, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future, right? If you're not seeing it yet, this is the point. This is what I want you to see is in all the cases, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, God remained faithful to the call, his call on their life. Zerubbabel's case, remember it said God was watching over them, and they were not stopped. And that reminds me of Jeremiah chapter one, where the Lord says to Jeremiah, you have seen correctly, for I am watching over my word to see that it is fulfilled. Sure, there was a resistance. Sure, there was resistance. There's a lot of resistance. But God was watching over his word to see that it was fulfilled in their life. Amen. The caller is the keeper. And that's something I felt like the Lord had given me this morning for you is that the caller on your life is also the keeper of the call. If they would have doubted when things got tough, like we often find ourselves doing, this isn't the call of God on my life because things are hard. If they would have doubted the, the call of God on their life and the assignment that he had given them, Jerusalem would have been left in a pile of rubble. But then because of their confidence in the call of God on their life, they saw revival come forth, which makes me wonder if we don't bow down and become scared of any resistance we face and we are confident in the call of God on our life, where might we also see revival come forth before our eyes? Lord, use us. Okay, so how can we be certain of God's calling in the current assignment? If you're taking notes, I hope that you might write this down. I have three, three of these things, uh, and then for each one of these, there's a reverse point that I would like. It's not gonna be up on the screen, so it might be helpful to write it down. Three ways we can be certain this morning that for every one 
of you. God's calling is on your life, but how can we be certain that we're walking in it? Here's the first one, is that there is fruit despite resistance. When you're able to see fruit in your life despite the resistance that you are facing, be encouraged because it means God is still working and moving. It's important to also qualify what fruit means is because often I think we think like, oh, okay, if our call is to rebuild the temple or the walls, it's like fruit of that means that it's all finished and it's this grand old thing. And, uh, you know, for today's world, it's like I, t- I posted a TikTok video and a million people were saved and, or I released a song and like thousands and thousands of thousands of people were impacted by it. But the reality is, is when we're in a tough time or we're facing a lot of resistance, doesn't sometimes the fruit just look like God-given perseverance or God-given faith in the midst of a tough season that I've been through I found that faith was a God-given miracle in my life and that the the fruit of in the evidence of God still working and moving in my calling and in my assignment was that I remained faithful despite everything that was going on and so fruit can look like a lot of different things But evidence that we are in God's calling is fruit despite resistance. The reversal of that, something you can write down, is what keeps you from walking in God's calling is submitting to resistance. It's giving up and letting the enemy win in your life. It's not trusting, not trusting that God will fight for you. When it comes to your calling, The God who calls you is the God who watches over his call to see it fulfilled. God the caller is God the keeper. He watches over his call, over the word on your life that he has given you. He watches over it to see that it will be fulfilled. When it comes to God's calling on your life, I wanna tell you, like I, I, know this from experience is God is serious about the calling on your life. He is serious about it. This is not a, a good suggestion. This is not a backup career option. This is not, if you're a gamer, this is not a side quest that he's given you. Like he is serious about the call of his call on your life. He is serious about it. He's probably more serious about it than you are but he will watch over his word and his call in your life to see that it is fulfilled. So when God calls you to something, we have to understand that he's not messing around. This isn't a suggestion. To walk in obedience is to follow the call and the assignment in the season. Second thing, we're gonna get to the second thing here. but I want, to set you fr- I want to set you free from the idea. This is a word that I felt like the Lord gave me for a specific person. And then I was, I was preparing for the message. I was like, man, this is like a word for, this is a word for God's calling on our life is I want to set you free from the idea that we have to search on our own for God's calling on our life. Like this is something that we have, like it's like this game of hide and go seek with God or that he's dangling some carrot in front of our face that we just have to chase after or he's given us a treasure map of our life and like it takes our whole life to find our one true calling is it over here is it over there no where is it It it's nowhere I don't have a call in my life like we don't have to figure out God's plan for us because he's already spoke it over us the Bible says he knew us before we were in our mother's womb and he has a plan for you that he will speak over your life this isn't something that we have to find on our own We're not supposed to do this independent from God. He came up with the call in the first place and he is the caller and he is the keeper. So here's the second one. We can be certain of God's calling and the current assignment because it aligns with the kingdom of God and the heart of God. It aligns with the kingdom and the heart of God. So what, write this down. What's the reverse of that? What's the reverse that keeps us from walking in our calling? is walking in our broken humanity and our own human condition. What do I mean by that? God doesn't want to make it difficult for us. If it's his plan and his will, why would he hide it from us? If it's difficult to find your calling, it's likely that you're making it more difficult on yourself. 
we live and operate sometimes out of our brokenness and that actually prohibits us from seeing what God is doing. It becomes quite difficult to know and understand and follow God's call in your life if you're not with God. For example, living in our human condition is living and walking in sin. Augustine describes sin simply as anything that causes our separation and distance from God. The effect of sin on our life is that we become further and further and further away from God and then it's no wonder that we struggle to understand our purpose or our identity. Our human condition, another example is immaturity and pride, thinking that we can do it in fact on our own. Seeing our calling as something that we have to search for or come up with the right answer to say at our graduation parties of, oh, this is what I'm called to. I really, uh, really deep within me, I really feel like this. No, like that's prideful. It's not gonna come from you. It's gonna come from the Father who has spoken, over, spoken this over your life. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb and he has a plan for you. Another is living in complacency. This is the person who knows, he knows that God has a call on their life, an assignment for the season, but chooses not to act. This is the person who's waiting for their life to get a little less busy before they jump in. This is the person who's waiting for their life to be a little bit more organized before they operate in the assignment that God has for them. It's complacency. And then the last one that I wanna mention is comparison. Oh, comparison. <laughs> comparison is an epidemic. From the landscaping in front of your dang house compared to your neighbor, oh my gosh, that bothers me so much. The grass is always greener. Not, no, mine's the greenest. You know, that's so dumb. It's a, from comparing the landscaping to your house to the car that you drive, the job that you have, the house that you have, the vacation you went on, the social media post that you posted. Comparison is an epidemic. And we gotta understand that the church isn't immune from that either. It just might look different, packaged in a different way. Some people out here calling, comparing each other's spiritual giftings. Or, oh man, I wish I could pray like that person. The Spirit's really anointed, then I guess that's probably just not what I have. It's like we're out here comparing or comparing the calling of God on our life. Man, I really wish I had the call of that guy. It looks way cooler than mine. I don't even, you know. Comparison, it's toxic. You know when Zerubbabel had finally finished laying the foundation? He finally did it. Through the resistance, it says, so yeah, they had the foundation of the temple. It says, all the people gave a shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. So after all that they had been through, they let, I mean, they had just laid the foundation. Like it wasn't fully, fully done. But after all the resistance, he's like, we've laid the foundation. Let's give a shout and a praise to the Lord. And there's some people in the back crying because all that they can think about is the previous temple and how flashy and shiny that that one was. And this is just mere foundations. And so they're so busy comparing what God used to do or how God did it last time that they are legitimately blinded of how God is moving this time. A Bible scholar, Old Testament professor, he says this about that passage. He says, some clearly found the comparison bitterly disappointing. Others, however, refused to consider this as merely a day of just small things, but rather in faith allowed that ever such a day of restoration should have dawned at all. They were just grateful that the Lord had come through. I think we can be the same way though. Like, God, you called me to this, but I didn't think it would really look like that. Like I was called to students and to disciple the students, but then now they're calling me old and it's just kind of like a bummer and they're making fun of me. Or in my 20s, I thought I had it all figured out and then I actually got there and paid my first mortgage bill and I'm like, I can't help anybody because I can't even afford a house anyway, you know? Like, 
we compare our callings and we, we start to doubt God has a call in our life at all, or the, the guy speaking, the, the Randy Clarks of the ro- world, or the whoever's, or the, man, like God's calling is so special. I just, I wish God would have given me that one instead of whatever he has for me. And we start to compare the calling of God on our life with somebody else's. But in scripture, we see this beautiful, beautiful imagery of God's calling on our life imaged, imaged as a crown. The cr- a crown it, uh, symbolizes the reward that comes to the person who is faithful and fulfills God's calling on their life and remains throughout their entire life committed to the Lord and his call. And there's a crown, there's a crown waiting for each and every one of us. There's a calling over each and every one of your lives There's an assignment that he wants to give you and a crown that comes with it. But there's too many of us comparing other people's crowns, wanting crowns that don't fit our head and that will eventually crush us. We're wanting crowns that will crush us rather than just seeking the the plans that God has on our life. As we wrap up, I want to encourage you This will never change. This is the authority over our life. This is the word of God. Beyond this, he will speak to you in a special way. He will speak calling over your life, something that he won't speak to anybody else. That's the relational aspect of God, and I'm so thankful for it, that he has something for us. He wants this special moment with you. Charles Spurgeon says, you have not to look around upon others, but to look up to your God. The Bible says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So would we treasure him above everything else, even the crown that he's gonna place on our head, the crown that he's gonna place on somebody else's head, the resistance that we might be facing, would we value and treasure him above all else? Would we lay ourselves down before him, before the throne of God, desiring nothing else but just intimacy with the Father so that then he can pour out his call on our life? This isn't supposed to be a game of hide and seek. This is supposed to be found in the secret place with him. So he's not wanting to make it difficult. The reason it's difficult is because we're trying to do it apart from him. He wants to speak this over your life. He wants to call you to a purpose and he wants to assign you to things. But these, all of these words from the Lord are only found out of a place, that secret place, that deep, secret, intimate space with him. The caller is the keeper and he's looking to call you and to keep you, to speak things over your life. Amen? So good. I, yeah. I was just reminded this week as I was doing this of just some of the things that the Lord had spoken over me and just completely wrecked this week. It's been such a beautiful week with him. But the reality, he wants to take us to a place of intimacy. And that's, that's like where I felt like he asked me to finish us off here is the place of intimacy is where we are made aware of the calling that he has born in us from the very beginning. He's the water, he's the well, he's the hunger, he's the food, and he's everything. All good things come from him. That's the third and the final thing this morning. How can we be certain of God's calling in the current assignment? Is that it is found out of a place of intimacy. The reversal of that is that we are trying to find it on our own, thinking that we have to figure it out on our own, independent from the Father rather than understanding that it's from that secret place where everything else comes out of. Because eventually what's done in secret will come out. And so would we find our calling in the secret place so that that's what comes out instead of just trying to find it on our own? I'll speak this over you. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. You are a chosen people a royal priesthood and a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
from rubble and darkness, even in your own life, he has called you into the light to bring revival come forth in your own life, calling you and assigning you to things to see to it that what looks like just a pile of rubble in the world around us, to see to it that he has called you to see that come forth also to revival. On earth as it is in heaven, you will be used to bring revival here. Amen? Isn't that cool? We get to participate. Pull up that last chart, if you could, for me. There's room for you now. <laughs> but there's blank spaces for you to fill in. What has God spoken over your life? When's the last time you found the secret place where no one knows that you go? The place where your calling is born and spoken over you. The place where that God calling stirs your heart to the point that you're shaken and you can't escape it. The point where, despite the resistance, like Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, you can say, but the Lord cannot be stopped. What's the call of God on your life? What's the assignment for the season? All he wants is everything. All he wants is everything from you. <laughs> Your whole life, he wants it. But out of that givenness, he will make his call and his assignment known to you, stirring you for things that his heart longs to see. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The caller is the keeper. He is faithful. Would we be found faithful back to him, back to his call in our life? Amen? Would you stand with me? Thank you, Jesus. Our prayer team was praying this week and this morning. They came, uh, they felt like they had some words of knowledge that before I pray us out this morning, I wanna speak. Um, so words of knowledge is just things that we as a prayer team feel like the Lord has spoken to us uh, for people in the room. And so a lot of it deals with healing this time. And so if, this, if one of these words of knowledge resonates to you, uh, I would invite you, please come and receive prayer because the Lord is moving and wants to move on your life. So if any of these words of knowledge resonate with you after we're done praying, the prayer team is gonna come right up and they'd love to pray for you. So the first one is, I received a strong pain on the top of my left hand. Second one is the left calf. It could be a concern of a blood clot. The third one is IBS. The fourth one is there is someone who is suffering with intense headaches, likely migraines on the right temple and the pain is traveling to the right eye. I'm telling, if that is so specific, if that's you, the Lord is like about to do something. <laughs> the last one is the left knee. It's a very serious issue. The person has been told future knee replacement, bone on bone, left knee. The Lord wants to heal you. He still heals. He still moves. He still speaks. He still does all of these things that we're talking about. So come and receive prayer if, that was, if that's you. But let's, let's pray before we close this out. God, first and foremost, we receive the broad call on our life back to you. Oh, we are called to you, Jesus. And that, that's why that last thing is so important, intimacy with you because that's our call. That's where everything else is born out of. That's where everything that we receive, that's where it comes from. Our call to you. God, to help us keep our eyes on our first love, to learn how to not walk this life independent from you. But God, get to a place that we we would be fully given to you. Fully given over to your plan and your will for our life. 
God, where it doesn't have to become difficult or a game of hide and go seek anymore, where, where we know and understand our call from you and the assignment that you have for us out of this place of intimacy. God, draw us near to your heart. Stir our hearts for the things that you long to see. God, use our hands and our feet in your plan for the world to bring your kingdom here on earth. God, would we see miracles and healings and blessings being poured out in our midst because of this place of intimacy and a deep desire to do the things that you've called us to do. God, would we see more of all of this I'm so thankful for your word, your truth, and I'm so thankful that you continue to speak over us to every single person in this room. You have a special place with them. I'm so grateful that you do that. Father, I pray as we seek to search after you and a greater intimacy. God, I pray blessing and anointing over everyone in this room during that time. In that secret place, God, I just pray that you would pour out oil upon them. God, that they wouldn't have to wait until Sunday morning to maybe get a little taste of you, but God, that they would walk into this building with oil on their hands. Our hearts are so for you, God. We give you everything, everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, if you received a word of knowledge this morning, would you come up and receive prayer? If not, that's all right. Enjoy your Sunday. We'll see you next week.